Welcome back to Bible study, to Paul's letter to the Colossian church. We made great progress last week. We managed to get through four verses effectively. So we're going to start this week with, I think it's Ian reading yeah. um, from verse 22 of chapter three of Colossians. Welcome, Alan. Welcome, Ian. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Tim. And we're reading from the uh, New King James Version of the Bible, if you want to follow it in your own Bibles. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 22. Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleases, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what is done, and there is no partiality. Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Amen. Amen. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to quieten our minds, quieten our hearts before you now as we study your word. And Lord, we know that it means a lot to you how we relate to one another Yes. in whatever position we are in. And I know the Scriptures talk about servants and masters. It talks about husbands and wives. It talks about children and parents. It talks about all sorts of relationships. And we are so eager to get that right. So may your Holy Spirit dwell in us and may we relate to one another as you would wish us to. And may we worship you and put you in the very center of our beings, constantly following your lead in our lives. Amen. 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 Okay, so we're still in a cultural context where, where Paul is writing, uh, and we, we've moved on to this idea of how um, servants should relate to masters. Is Paul endorsing slavery? Sorry for that googly. But no, it's yeah. not. It's a very good question. Uh, in, in, in a very real sense, he is. Uh, but the reason being is that what you, again, you've got to look at the context, that, that you've got to look at the context in that sense that, remember, people were saying of Christianity that it was causing chaos, uh, you know, and they were basically, Basically, Christians were being equated to pagans. You know, they're coming into this world and causing chaos. So, you know, the, the, the Roman society looked on us as we often look on people who are, um, you know, challenging Christian morality. You know, we would, we would say they're causing chaos. So what Paul is trying to do is bring some order back into, into the uh, situation and that's where he, he he talks about family relationships relationships between master and bondservant but he also talks about relationship between the citizen and authorities as well and with that in all of them there is a sense of you know that uh, you know it is endorsing the status quo however the reality of it is that it's very subtle in the sense of by endorsing the status quo he was actually undermining, and Christianity in the end undermined everything mm. of the Roman society mm. from top to bottom. Mm. So, so in many ways, you know, th that um, 
Uh, th this is the issue that I, I have. Uh, you know, I, I, like you, Tim, I've been involved in, in party politics. Mm -hmm. And I've come to the conclusion that, you know, that, that, that the best way to change society is to preach the gospel mm -hmm. and pray for revival, you know, changing root and branch, um, which is actually would be endorsed by the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. Here, um, that's the sort of way we, you change society. Mm. I understand and respect people, for example, in Britain and in America, Christians who actually say, look, we've got to get our hands on the levers of power. Mm. The problem is, is that often when you get your hands on the levers of power, one, you find it being disconnected underneath. Or secondly, you get corrupted by it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, absolutely. So, so Alan, the, the is it, is it a case that there's a contract, you know, between the, the bond servant and, and the master, or is it just a completely unequal relationship where the bond servant doesn't have a chance or a right. choice? Right, I, I think we've got to look at two things. Let's have a look at what, in the context, first century <clears throat> Asia Minor, mm. what's going on there. They're under Roman rule. That means that they're under Roman law. What the Romans did was they said, we will conquer nations and we will bring Roman law to those nations. It was slightly different from how Alexander the Great did it. The way he did it, he said, we will let them keep their laws so long as they gave tribute to us mm. and so long as we so rule over them, but we will allow them to keep their law. Now, to a certain extent, the Romans allowed some kind of religious law, but Generally speaking, they impose Roman law on the Roman Empire. That's their way of doing things. And under Roman law, slavery is allowed. All right? Under Roman law, there are penalties. There's a range of punishments for slaves running off. Mm. Things like that. Okay. That's the context. And therefore, the relationship between a slave and a master is not a contractual relationship. Mm -hmm. It is a legal relationship imposed by the rules of the state. The, the state decides on that relationship. Okay? Yeah. Now, there are parallels in the Mosaic law. Under Mosaic law, Moses says, if Israel is at war with an enemy and they kill the enemy soldiers and they capture virgins and uh, an Israeli soldier wants to marry that virgin, then there are certain rules attached to marrying her. Or if you want to take slaves from your enemies, there are certain rules to slavery. So it's not that it's different in terms of allowing and not allowing slavery. It's just that their rules were slightly different. So it's not a contractual thing. Mm -hmm. Now, in the modern context, obviously, there is no slavery. That's been abolished and the state doesn't intervene except through the Equality Act and, say, health and safety and that sort of thing. The employer and employee are more or less free economically to contract how much the wage will be, how often it will be paid, weekly or monthly. Now, the state will intervene if the wage isn't being paid, okay? Because that's and of course, part of politics is is saying what is fair, and what, what is, is fair, fair, and what isn't rate, fair. That the, there will be various rules about it, various rules about pension contributions. We're, we're not really talking about that. It's contractual in the sense that any employee may leave employment at any time. They're not bound. Mm -hmm. Whereas under Roman law, if a slave runs away, mm -hmm. there are consequences, and sometimes they're very severe consequences, even execution for certain types of slaves running away. And incidentally, Paul did deal with one such situation. He came across a runaway slave. That slave became a follower of Christ. The master is also a and follower of Christ. And that was um, Onesimus. Yes, yeah. that's right. And so, so we have examples of Paul. De he, he, he wasn't a theoretician and sort of dealing in theory, living in his ivory tower. Mm -hmm. He was grappling on a daily basis with these issues all the time. Mm. And this is where it's coming out of. So having said, in Christ there is no master or slave. 
In Christ, there is no male or female. In Christ, there is no Greek or Jew. Mm -hmm. Everybody is equal. Now, under Roman law, the master is more valuable than the slave. As far as Paul's concerned, they're of equal value. Mm. So he's, he's grappling with something and he's putting pen to paper for a, for a situation that has never been encountered before, where the whole attitudinal thing had to change. So your attitude to your slave must be, he is of equal value in God's eyes to me. And the slave's attitude is, I am of equal value to my master and my master's equal value mm. to me as far as God is concerned. And yet I serve him. So how does one go about? Can I just ask about the, you know, where it talks about, you know, the masters being right and fair. Was that stipulated by Roman law or was Paul breaking the mould? In, in, in terms absolute. of, could, could he, he, Paul was, let's give Ian a, a shout on that. I mean, Paul was breaking the mould in that they didn't, under Roman law, necessarily have to be right and fair. The, the, no, they had no rights. Slaves yeah. had no rights under Roman law. And they were property. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so he was being very radical again mm. in, in, in the relationships. Um, he, you know, he, he's being very... Um, well, he's completely going against the norms of their Roman society. And, and, and so often, and that's sadly, you know, many people look at Christianity as very conservative with a small c, you know, you know where, whereas it wasn't. And that, that was the basis of your initial question. Mm -hmm. Was he endorsing mm -hmm. uh, slavery? Not really, but, but yes, he was, but not really. Mm. Uh, you know, because he was actually completely turning it about and changing the whole concept of the master-slave. And he couldn't actually put in the pen to paper refuting absolutely. the Roman law. Absolutely, and, 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 that gets, uh, and this brings up... To the, to, and brings a question which, which we often... Is, is that what's the best way of changing our society? I mean... Uh, mm. In, in, in British society, you know, they, you, you have two models, for example, around about the same time. You had the revolution, which happened, for example, in the Russia, which then became the Soviet Union. You had the rev Marxist revolution, where they, they said, we're going to change the relationship between serf and master. Mm -hmm. right? And then you had, in Britain, you had a parallel revolution it was a, it was a quiet revolution you, you you had all the laws with regards to education uh, with regards to um, pensions with regards to working hours uh, with regards to ages of you know work you know with regards to you know uh, provision for health and things like that you had a basically a silent revolution incidentally mostly implemented by Christians, I mean, mm. for example, uh, Cadbury and Roundtree, you know, their, their, their villages which they built mm. in the Midlands mm. w were, were Id idyllic in the sense that, you know, the, the way that the, the worker was provided mm. for by their Christian master, yeah. you know, and the, and, the, and the loyalty which was then shown by the, by, by the worker. Now, you had those two models and you have to say, which is the Christian way of doing things? And I think it has to be the British way of doing things because what have we got in Russia today? We've, we've got basically a reversal to where they were. <laughs> you know, different so people. sort of compassionate capitalism. I, I, would, I, I would say, uh, I wouldn't even mention the word capitalism. No. I, 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 would say, I would say the application of Christian principles to business. Mm. Mm. You know, you know. Yeah. And we that's what develop that further. In a, it's an interesting discussion. In, in a way, that that's what Paul was doing. He he was. This is uncharted territory. You know? in the, it's not so much obeying the master. See, Paul wasn't talking about that. He was talking about the, the, what was underlying the relationship. Mm. In the, the, the reason under Roman law, the reason the slave had to obey the master was because he was the master's property. Mm. Under law, one belonged to the other. One had a higher value and one had a lower value. One had a high status and one had a low status. Paul is saying, this has nothing to do with status. Mm. 
This has everything to do with your faith, because faith was central. He wasn't saying, because you're a Christian, you have to do things this way. He's saying, because you're a Christian, things are this way. Because you follow the Christ, then look at him. What did he do? He emptied himself to become a servant and to death. And that's, what, that's why he keeps saying again and again, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Okay? Not just paying lip service. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. So what he's trying to do is, he's saying, it doesn't matter whether you're the master or the slave. Either way, whatever you do, do it as if the other guy were Christ. Now, where did he get this from? Well, he got it from Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. Jesus himself said, on the last day, the Son of Man will come in his glory and he will divide the nations. We are familiar with that passage. Then he, he will say, well done, good and faithful servant, because when I was in prison, you came to visit. When I was naked, you gave me clothes. When I was hungry, you fed me. And then they'd say, well, what are you talking about? We never even met you. And he said, whatever you did to the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. Mm. Those are the words of Jesus. All this is, is, is an application of that. Treat the other guy as if he's Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Treat the other guy just as if yeah. you're treating the Christ. Mm -hmm. That way you can't go wrong and you will fall into that category of sheep, not goats, mm -hmm. because the goats were the ones mm -hmm. who didn't treat the other guy as if they were Jesus. The sheep were the guys who did treat the other guy yeah. as if they were Jesus. Yeah, and the other one is the old, the outward appearance, you know, the end of Romans uh, 2, where it says, you know, that he's looking for circumcision of the heart by the spirit and not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, mm. but from God. Mm. In other words, you, uh, here it's, it talks about not just working when their eye is on you. Yes, yes that's right. Um, so this is, um, Again, if you're doing it unto the Lord, the eyes of the Lord are on you all the time, you know, and you're looking for his, for praise from you know, the well done, good and faithful servant from God, which is not seen in terms of the, the visible relationship with the slave and, and it's master. Not, yeah, and it's not even outcome based. I don't do things for the Lord because I wish to be rewarded. Mm. I do it because he's worthy of my service. I'll just give you an illustration. I, I used to go down to visit uh, something called Anchor Recordings down in, oh. in, in Ashford. And there's a lady there, I think she's mo moved on, but it was maybe 15, 20 years ago. And um, she, it was a cassette tape ministry. So they had David Pawson, they had Sproul, they had, you know, David Watson. They had a whole load of different ministries and she was putting the labels on absolutely meticulously. Mm. And I said, I said, wow, you know, that's really, you're really putting, and it was in one sense a thankless task. And she just turned to me and she said, as unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. That's wonderful, isn't it? Yes, it absolutely. It's a menial thing to do, but she was doing it to the absolute best. And that was her answer. It's a yeah. cracker, isn't it? Yeah. And, I, and when she first said it, I don't know, me as a cynic, I wasn't old, I was a young cynic then, I, th I thought, you're joking, aren't you? <laughs> but actually, no, she wasn't. Mm. Yeah. She was absolutely serious. Yeah, yeah. Um, can I ask about, you know, we, you know, today people talk about human trafficking and, and modern day slavery and sex slavery. What, how, how does this apply in that situation? where uh, uh, we, I suppose we talked about it last week, where we talked about a delinquent husband. Okay, you've got an oppressive master completely exploiting you um, and not being just and fair. What, sh what should the slave do in that situation? Oh, I see what you mean. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, first of all, um, I, 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 
it goes back to do what is just and fair. And a lot of the times that the uh, modern slavery is manipulative, it's abusive. It probably was in those days. And yeah, and it could have been then. It so what been, does the it, slave it do could, in that it could situation? Have been, it could have been there. I, I, I think that um, things have moved on in the sense that uh, slavery is now by most, well, almost every every country is outlawed. Well, it's sometimes some countries turn a blind eye to it. So therefore, I think that, um, you know, we have to, as it were, what is just and fair is that we have to abolish it mm. uh, and, um, and stand on the side of the... How should someone who is under the cosh under the shackle of you mean some, you, slavery. You mean, you mean someone who is... For How a, should they read let, this? Let's, let's be very specific about it. Yeah. Let, let's be specific about it. Uh, you know, a modern slave is a, is a girl that's captured. Mm. It may even be a, 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 British, a, Brit, a British girl. But it, mm. it could be... Usually it's someone from Eastern Europe who's mm. been persuaded to come to uh, Britain mm. or and some they have Western their passport country. taken from them. Uh, and then as soon as they arrive in, they have their passport taken from them and they have to operate it usually as sex slaves. Mm. Uh, you know, what's the right thing to do? Mm. In, by any measure, that is wrong and I would have no problems in, in saying that this does not get, apply. Get this, out this, of it. This does not apply. The, this teaching does not apply to that circumstances no, because we're, we're talking about basically household slaves here. Mm. You know, mm. we're talking about servants. Servants. You know, mm. we're, we're talking about that. We're, we're not talking about. Okay, just going. Okay, so that's an extreme example. Let, let's take uh, an example where someone is being exploited in work, and, and and it can be more subtle than it used to be in the olden days in terms of the masters and you know the yeah, serfs. I mean, like, um, like, like the gig economy the, today. I was going to say that, yeah. or even people. I mean, the yeah. way it works now. Where, and I know personally situations of friends where, where they are so squeezed at work, yeah. you know, they have, um, they nick someone's car and it's like the end of the world for yeah. them because they literally have no slack at all financially. Yeah. Yeah. What do they do? Yeah. They're literally being squeezed to their limit. And that's not compassionate capitalism, by the way. Mm is capitalism gone completely, you yeah, know? Yeah, and, and that's, and, and that's right. really, and I suppose you can't answer that question by, by first, without first addressing the question, what is just and fair? Yeah. Because in, in chapter four and verse one, it says, masters, give your bond servants what is fair and just, or just and fair, knowing that you have a master in heaven. So we have to define what is just and what is fair. And we start with that criteria. What is just and fair is a fair wage for a fair mm. uh, week's work. Mm. Um, what is just and fair is, is then you actually have to actually say, you know, what about are they paid sick leave? Are they paid holiday leave? Mm. Uh, you know. But even paid, sick leave uh, is, paid, it, it, they, you know, the way paid, the law's it, framed, uh, well, are, are they people paid can't that? survive now, on I, I would say in a modern society, a modern Western society, British society, because mm. you know, then those are th those criteria are just unfair. I, I would even say that pension provision is 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 part of what's uh, just and fair. Um, that, that that that's you know that's my view. Now now what what you have to then say is that if you're working for a company that doesn't give any of those, you know you know should you be should you and, be? And well, while we're on just and fair, I, I would go further just to, to burnish my credentials of not being a, a sort of economic hawk. I, I actually um, believe that the whole financial system is unjust. Yeah. And, and anonymous share capital is, is unjust. The masters of the universe yeah. don't care a fig about the people down at the bottom end, yeah. and they shift money irrespective of how that will affect yeah. uh, not only individuals but communities. That yeah. is not a just yeah. system. Yeah. And then obviously right down at the coalface, you've got someone who is being told by so, Paul that, you know, so, just so grin and bear it. The criteria basically is Paul is saying, he's saying this basically so that not to upset the, the apple cart, as to use a adage, 
or, or just so that to, to, just so that the Christians are not labelled as being re completely revolutionaries, you know. So what? Now we're in a different situation in the sense that, you know, that that that, you know, what the situation now would be called idyllic by Paul uh, compared to what it is. So we're in a different situation. So therefore, we have to take the teaching of the Apostle Paul here and then apply it to the situation. And what that means is that. If you work for someone, you work, you, 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 you work fairly, you work hard, you work conscientiously. You don't steal. You know, you know, you know you, you, if you're contracted to work a certain amount of hours, you work them, and sometimes you work more because you're doing it to the Lord. Mm -hmm. right? That's the first thing. That's the first. The second thing is if you're, if you're, if you're a, a, an employer, you have to do that which is just and fair, which... Uh, outlines the things I just outlined mm. there. And I know that we've got a situation now where it's, co it's gone completely, all the givens of the 1950s, 40s, 50s and 60s have all gone. I mean, we, it, we're, we're building up a situation where, you, you, know, uh, you, you know, young people, I mean, my, you know, my, I have a son who's a Cambridge graduate, works in a brilliant job, and he's saying, Dad, when I retire, I'll have virtually no pension. Whereas that wasn't a state with me. When, you know, I, I, you know, the, I didn't even think about my pension because it was just there. Yeah. But today, things have just gone completely the other way. Yeah. Uh, and um, you know, and we've got we've got to actually, uh, we've got to go back and say, look, what is just and fair? And answer the question. I, I was talking to an American employer recently, and they, and I was talking about. I was saying, what, what, what about, what about health care? Mm. What about pensions? Mm. He says, I don't provide any of that. No one provides it for me. Why should I provide it for any of my employees? Mm. Now, I would actually say that sort of attitude is counter to what is... Mm. And uh, by the way, the pensions industry is the other one. So, so um, you've got the people put money for their pension, but that pot which they want to grow, I know. where is it being invested? Is it, is it going into a slavery I, situation? I know. So we all are all culpable in this I, modern I, world. I, 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 I know. The, the thing, things have changed in the sense that uh, 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 employers used to put aside a certain amount of money towards the pensions, right? And, and usually they were invested in, in basically reliable, uh, what do they call them, gold-plated, yeah. A scheme, yeah. you know, the bank edged. Guilt edged. Guilt edged. You know, no, none of these risky. Defined, uh, whatever that is. Yeah, whatever. Whereas, whereas, and it actually used to be used, for example, to, to for the, the economy. It was put back into the economy. So it was, a it was sort of like a, a, a golden circle, you know, where money for employees was put back, uh, invested for the employees, which then went into the investment for the employee. Uh, blue chip, you blue were. Chip. Blue chip was the blue word I was, was trying to Because there's an element of, sla see, as I see it, okay, yeah. there's an element of slavery in the, the, the sort of economic model that we're living in, where you, people have a mortgage. You know, they, they have to borrow money to live and then they are basically enslaved to the mortgager, yeah. you know, who basically is, they're, they're working for the bank, basically. And, um, and the same with this, this pension thing, you know, literally storing up treasures on earth. But it's saying here that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. Well, that, yes. That's what Paul is doing is he's disconnecting the reward that your master gives you to and, and connecting you to the Lord. Mm. So you have an earthly master and the way you relate to the earthly master is if you're nice to him, he's nice back to you mm. and that's how the world goes round and round and round. That's how the world works. He's saying, don't look at the outcome because when the master's not looking, you might be tempted to go and have a little nap and things like that. Mm -hmm. But do it as if you're doing it unto the Lord. And when you do that, what you will find is that your reward then comes back from the Lord. Mm -hmm. And therefore, this, being, this relationship you're in with your master 
fades into insignificance compared to the relationship you have with your Lord. Yeah. And so he's trying to, in a way, without upsetting the apple cart, because you, you don't need to upset the apple cart, without upsetting the apple cart, he's fixing the Christian audience eyes back onto the Lord. And with that, he's effectively elevating uh, their, their whole life, yeah. Yeah. because then they're living on a different plane. Yeah. They're not living on this earthly plane, they're in the world, but they're not of the world. Mm -hmm. Again, another thing that Jesus said. And so we're back to him saying, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord, mm -hmm. knowing that. So he gives a reason why you should treat your master as if he were Christ. Knowing that from the Lord, the actual Lord, you will receive the reward, reward of the inheritance because they already are inheritors of the Abrahamic covenant. Mm. That's what Galatians says. Mm. We're co-heirs. Yeah. We're co-heirs, all right, of Abraham's inheritance, the blessing. So the blessing comes from the Lord, not from your wages. The wages may well be the mechanism by which your family is fed and you put bread on the table. Mm. The wages may well be the mechanism by which you get housing or you pay the rent or you pay your mortgage. That is God's arrangement, but your arrangement is with the Lord. Mm. Your contract, it's not a contract, it's mm. a covenant, mm. is with the Lord. You serve him, he looks after you. Mm. He may well use your master mm. and the wages he gives you as his means of looking after you on this earth. He can choose any means he wants. You could, you but what he's done is he's decoupled it. Yeah. He's decoupled it. So you're working for God, mm. but you're working in the factory. Mm. It's you're receiving wages from God, but it's coming from your master's bank account. Mm. That's what he's doing. It's revolutionary. It's yeah. turning everything upside down. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a very helpful analogy, um, but when you go into, I think it's in Romans 4, where it talks about that when you're um, paid wages, it's an obligation, but, when, but it's saying that uh, righteousness is credited to you as a gift. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just wonder, you know, we, we've got to be careful that we're, we're not seeing that reward as something that, you know, when, when in the final analysis we look at it, it's actually not deserved. Mm. No, no, it's not reward for works. It's not reward it's, for it's works. But because you relate to the Lord, mm. you're serving the Lord, the form your service takes for some people is to be a missionary. Mm. To some people is to become a pastor or a visiting preacher or whatever. Mm. That's full-time ministry. You call it what you like. For some people is to work in a factory or a hospital or a school. For some people, serving God is in that environment, but you're serving God, not the employer. But by serving God, you're actually serving the employer better than somebody else who's simply there for the wage. Can it, I give you another illustration? I've given you the one as unto the Lord at Anchor Recordings. I also knew a gardener who, who worked for the Queen at Windsor Castle. And I said, wow, what a wonderful privilege. You know, what did, what did you do there? He said, he said, oh, we just, you know, tried to dodge the, the foreman and, you know, most of the time we were sleeping. <laughs> That's what he actually said to me. He just completely took the rug from underneath because I thought, what a privilege. And, and again, in the illustration from that, it, for, for Christians, what a privilege it is to be working for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords as unto him. And what an absolute disgrace, you know, for most Christians, let's say, to just um, drift along and evade, yeah. you know, their responsibilities. And, and to be fair on, um, you know, we talked about capitalism. Mm. A lot of what we've got today is a reaction to what we had and after I left university, I worked uh, f uh, for 
15 years in industry as, as an engineer, engineering manager. And it was a nightmare dealing with the unions. It was, you know, if, a, if, a, if someone was contracted to work 40 hours a week, you're lucky if you got 10 hours work out of them. Mm. You re and I'm, yeah. I'm not exaggerating. It was, it was so, the, the, the boot was completely on the side of the unions. And that, that is just as bad as capitalism unleashed, yeah. which we have today. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we, we, it just emphasizes that we've got to go back to a biblical model mm. of relationships you know, the relationships between the master and the servant, mm. or the boss and the, and the employee. Mm. We've got to go back to a biblical understanding. Mm. And, and we, th this letter is written to Christians. Yes. Yeah. To a Christian church. And, and you, you know, you have to say that, you know, it only works if, if, if people are seeing it through that lens, that, that sometimes it, when things from the scriptures that are written for the church drift into politics or into a utopian, yeah. you know, I, I, ideological view of society, it doesn't work. Yeah. And that's the same on the capitalist and the communist side. Yeah. And, and I have to say, you know, it's a good, I'm glad you raised mm. that. Some of the worst employers are Christians. Mm. The, the way they take advantage of people. That's a bit like Edwina Curring saying most of the eggs, you know, have salmonella. I mean, you can't say most. Well, I, you, I, I, I said many. Uh, many. Yeah, okay. Okay, many. Yeah. Did I say most? Mm. I apologise. You may not Ma have done. I might have. Many yeah. uh, are, are of Christian employers. Mm. Uh, I mean, we, you know, whether, whether it comes to, uh, for example, uh, the stipend that is paid, that, that tied housing, mm. you know, that, that, that so often ministers uh, are, are tied and there are certain, often there are families within the churches who basically manipulate the minister knowing yeah. that his housing, That's his right. job, yeah. his wife's job, his family's, yeah. you know, if, if he goes against what is happening then he loses his house. He's, he that is modern move, slavery. Takes takes the kid, takes yeah. has to take the kids out of school, yeah. and all sorts of things like. And, and it's 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 manipulation of the worst mm. kind. Yeah. And uh, I have to say, I, I've had some excellent. But what a triumph if if in that situation they do well, it as unto the Lord. But I, it is wicked. You, you do it as unto as unto the Lord. And um, but sadly, the, sadly, I have to say that they, they don't. I mean. Um, I could give numerous illustrations of, 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 I don't know how many people, young ministers who have come to me over the years who are in tears because they can't survive. Mm. Uh, My know. dad, by the way, went through this. He was a young pastor yeah. in an evangelical church, which will be nameless, although people can find it eventually. Uh, he, uh, and he was a young pastor. He lived in the vestry of the church yeah. and he had his first child. Um, first of eight, he had basically nothing, and he yeah. definitely the 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 diaconate was manipulating him and trying to control what he preached even. Yeah. And when he um, eventually was turfed out, uh, it, it, even the bicycle that he was given by a member of the congregation was taken back. They said they wouldn't he wouldn't need it anymore, and he had to go looking for work down in the factories. Yeah. Um, so you, you, it's a tough thing when you're in that straitjacket to actually stand against it. Yeah, I, I, but, know um, it I know it is. It, it's very difficult. Yeah. And the temptation is to, is, to, is to compromise what you preach mm. and what you say and how you lead. Mm. And it, it takes a lot of courage to, uh, to, yeah. to stand against it. Yeah. But, you know, we need to learn, you know, for ex Christian employees need to learn you know, from these principles, mm. particularly, we need to set an example, yeah. um, you know, with regards to, you know, are we paying a living wage? Mm. You, you know, we, right. I mean, for it. example, I don't know what it's like in other traditions of the church or, or denominations, but in Baptist, we don't actually, in our, in our, we actually don't call them contracts, but they are contracts, they're called terms of service. Mm. But no, no hours of work is mentioned. Uh, 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 usually it's a, what you call a standard stipend, mm. um, uh, but which is 
you know, is probably about £23,000 a year, £24,000 a year, and plus a house. A lot more than it used to be. A lot more than it used to be. Mm. Uh, but but it's it's still not if you've got a family it's it's mm. it's not it's not livable. Uh, so so you have that, but then you divide that no hours of work have done it. And for example, um, you know that you could work seven days a week because you don't have Saturday and Sunday off. Mm. And and often you know they they they, they have a day off. Mm. But sometimes that day off is given begrudgingly, one day a week. And it's the only it's the only situation I know in the world, where in in the Western world, where a, an employee is contracted to work six days a week. Mm. Absolutely. Can, can I just um, pick up? Uh, we're still in chapter three, although we've gone uh, gone over into chapter four. That, um, in, in Romans uh, uh, 2, it says, those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honour and immortality, there will be eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be trouble and distress. There will be wrath and anger for everyone who does evil and glory, honour and peace for everyone who does good. And then it says, for God does not show favouritism. And, and we have here, it, the, in the last verse, we talked about the rewards, yeah. but then the flip side of that is for those who do wrong, yeah. they will be repaid. Now, that, that's a warning shot, isn't it, even for it, Christians? It is, but the way I read it, and I might be wrong, <clears throat> I don't think he's talking spiritually now. I think he's saying that if you as a slave on this earth to an earthly master... Uh, you don't do what you're supposed to, you don't work hard and you don't perform well, then that master will punish you. Mm. And he's almost saying God can't protect you or the Lord won't protect you mm. when you're punished for disobedience or uh, underperformance or doing things shoddily. Mm. I, I, I th but doesn't I don't, it follow directly about the inheritance from the Lord? No, but then, I, 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 think, I think it's a fresh... Th okay. This is my own okay, take. Yeah. Now... I won't disagree with somebody no. who says, no, all of this is spiritual. Both 24 and 25 are spiritual mm. inheritance and spiritual reward, mm -hmm. uh, as well as um, a spiritual punishment. Mm. But what I think is, he's saying, bond servants obey your masters in the flesh. Mm. Then 23 and 24 are taking it into the spiritual realm. And then 25 is bringing it back to earth and saying that you're going to have, you're going to have to face the consequences if you don't obey your earthly masters because I and we the church and I the apostle are not advocating that just because you're equal to them uh, you can refuse to work for them. But what does it say in your version? So mine says there's no favouritism. Yeah, there is no partiality. In other words, yeah, God is in is. favour. On earth, there is. That's the point. No, well, I, I think there, what there this... There is injustice. Okay, so this is what I'm saying, what I think I'm saying mm -hmm. is that God isn't going to... God isn't going to protect you because you're a Christian. Okay. If yeah, in this world you don't serve your master yeah. appropriately, yeah. and the okay. punishment will come from the master, but God won't protect you yeah. from that earthly punishment. Yeah. It's like if <clears throat> if you're a Christian and you're caught, you know, speeding or shoplifting, mm. whatever the consequence of the law is, yeah. God isn't going to miraculously protect you. Yeah. Got that, yeah. Um, but then you, you've got in the Psalms, you know, why do the wicked prosper? And, and uh, the reality is that oh. this isn't automatic, that you're going to get a, a reward or you're going to, uh, if you do wrong, that it's going to work against you. In this modern world, you know, there are plenty of people who, who, who benefit from um, not acting uprightly. So that's my point. There is favouritism. There is partiality in this in, 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 yeah, but, in the world. But the point, Paul is speaking to Christians mm. here. Yeah. And he's actually saying, first of all, you ought to do it because it's right. Mm. You're doing it to the Lord. Mm. Secondly, however, the background of that is, don't you understand, you'll be judged. Mm. Your actions have a consequence. Mm. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's right and correct to actually... To put those two things, you ought to, we ought to do it because it's right. Mm. Yeah. You know, um, you know, employers 
ought to look after their employees because it's right. Employees ought to act responsibility, responsibly mm -hmm. towards their employees because it is right. Mm -hmm. However, failing you to understand that, you're not doing these things in abstract. You're not doing them in secret. God sees. That's right. So it's and under he will the judge. overarching. He, he will judge. And I would actually add that the whole story of the second coming and the judgment seat of Christ is that justice will be seen to be done one day. So the unjust employer will be exposed sure. one day. That's what I one believe. One day. And, that's what and, I believe. And I think that that's important to remember. Yeah. That, that. So, um, okay. So... That's our framework, and now we're, we're on to verse 2. We, we get into the right. spiritual... What I'd like to do is to right. leapfrog to verse 5 yep. and then come back to 2, yeah, and sure. I'll tell you why. Because we've been talking about bond servants and masters previously. Last week yep. we were talking about husbands, wives. And we're talking about relationships. Yeah. And I think Paul is rounding off this passage yes. with verse 5. Verse 5 rounds it off by saying, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean outside the church, outside Christianity, mm. redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer mm. each one. Each one that is not a Christian. Mm. Any attacks that you get from outside, mm. yeah. any snide remarks, any persecution. Yeah. So he's saying how to deal inside the church, how to deal with masters and slaves, and vice versa, and then he's rounding off by saying, you're the church, but when you're conversing with, dialoguing with, intercoursing with mm. anybody outside, yeah. then do it like this. And that is like the global um, model. That's but right. And, and well, what, it, what they call in dialogue circles today, the other, how you treat the other. That's it. And it's how... And it, it, all of this is relational. Yes. Having said, there's no slave or free, there's no Roman or no. there's no Greek or... Jew, there's no yeah. male of. He's, having said all of that, everybody's equal. Yeah. He's now saying, how do you relate to other people? Mm -hmm. And within that, uh, that's why I'd like to come back to verse sure. uh, 2 to 4, yeah. which is just the introductory to, yeah. saying how you relate to those outside the church. Yeah. Yeah. And he says... Or generally, those who are different or, or, or are different not of or, your... Or not, that's right. Yeah. And... As an introduction to that, he, talk, he brings in prayer, mm. because this is so key, because I don't believe that those in the church can relate to those outside the church in the way that Paul is advocating here, without earnest prayer. So that's why verse 2 starts with, continue earnestly in prayer, mm. being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. So you have to give thanks for the fact that you are under persecution. There are people out there who don't understand Christianity. Therefore, they don't understand you. They don't understand your choices. They don't understand why you're sticking with your spouse instead of divorcing. They don't understand any of these things. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Why are you still doing this dead end job? Why aren't you skiving off like other people do? Take long lunch hours. Why, why are you... They're getting in this earful. Continue in prayer with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us. So he's now turning it to those inside the church. There are certain people within the church who have an evangelistic ministry mm. that needs to go and reach out to those outside the church. Yeah. So before saying how to interact with those outside, he's saying pray for us mm. that are within the church that need to engage with those outside. Yeah. Paul, not only was he trying to evangelize, he was trying to defend his own life under Roman law at this time. And he was someone who was literally crossing barriers. Um, in, uh, and the lesson is for, you know, why, not so much wives, husbands, children, parents, but could be, but certainly slaves, masters, you want to open the door for the message. Yes. By your behavior, you're going to open the That's door. That's right. For, for the, the message of the gospel to be. And it makes okay. sense. It's, it's so it's not out of place. For me, mm. it's inherent in a passage on relationships that he asked for prayer that God would open a door for the word, mm. for them to speak the mystery of Christ because he's in chains, because he's in prison, yeah. that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. He's asking for prayer for himself yeah. 
in the midst of talking about relationships, but this is why. Yeah. That's powerful, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's the, the whole objective, isn't it? Is, is for the message. You know, we, we've been talking Ultimately. about all of the nuts and bolts of relationships, but you know, what Paul's basically saying is, look, if you, if you mess up in your relationship as the subservient or the over whatever employer, um, you're not going to have any open door for the message. Mm. There is going to be no relationship. It's going to be you're trying to shaft each other. Uh, you know, there is no message yeah, in You that. have to model the model life. Yeah in order to dialogue with those outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I think it is a really powerful verse, isn't it, in terms of how we act towards outsiders. It's, it's universal. It covers all the relationships that we're talking about. Mm. Um, we, it's someone who is not us. Um, so you, you've got to be selfless and you've got to um, be brave and bold and step out of your comfort zone. You've got to reach out to the other. Mm. And all, all of this has been de-spiritualized in dialogue circles today and, and their approach is, oh, well, you, you've got to dialogue by um, coming to the lowest common denominator of belief, you know, and find the common ground and go that way. Paul isn't saying that. He isn't saying compromise all of your beliefs and then somehow that will open the opportunity for the gospel. He, he's saying, you know, live within the framework, but you know, act as unto That's the Lord. It. Absolutely. And that is the highest common denominator rather than the lowest. That's it. The phrase redeeming the time is interesting. I mean, yeah. the, the name redemption is usually you're talking about saving that which is lost. And what, what is the, impli the implication in this phrase is that if we don't do something active, then time can just drift away mm. and it's lost. Mm -hmm. Whereas we need to do something active to redeem that mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. to make something positive of that time, and of the limited time, and uh, and I think that's a, it's an important actual uh, uh, understanding of the whole uh, uh, the way we use time responsibly. Mm -hmm that it just doesn't sort of, we just don't drift through life, but we actively seek to redeem that time, to do something positive with that time, whether it is something about educating ourselves towards the Word of God, whether it is uh, reaching out to the lost. Mm. Uh, we're doing something positive which will change the world mm. for, for in a positive way. And, and then no, that's that was at the end of verse um, verse, five, verse five. The end of verse um, five. That's yeah, right. Redeeming. I mean, mine says make the most of every opportunity, which is another way of putting it, which Absolutely, is good. Absolutely, because we miss, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and at the end of the day, we don't always have an opportunity, mm. but we should make the most we, we, of every opportunity. We, we, we do. We do tend to drift, don't we? Yeah. And, and particularly in in our society today, which is focused upon leisure. Mm. and the right that we have leisure, that mm. when we don't have time, mm. you know, at work, then we, the opposite of that is we spend our time in leisure. Mm. And uh, this is very important. It's actually saying, you know, you, no, you've got to do something positive with your time. Mm. Redeem the time. Mm. I mean, how do we redeem the time? I mean, it may be, it may be... In the present, because <laughs> you, well, you can't go back, you can't redeem time that's past. Well, you past. can re redeem future time in the, in the sense yeah. that, that, that you, you can learn from the past. I mean, mm. I believe redeeming the time, I think education is an important part of redeeming mm. the time. Mm. I, I believe mission is an important part mm. uh, of redeeming the time. And that is perfect timing. Yeah. I, I mean, there are, I could give you a hundred poems on time, but uh, just in my old study, there is Count That Day Lost, whose low descending sun views from thy hands no worthy action done. Mm. I think it applies. Mm.